All right, hello everyone. I'm Keith Stone with the Harvard University Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'd like to welcome you back to the Cosmos Society online open house series, our venue that's meant to bring current researchers into conversation with the broader CHS community. Our guest today is Dr. Kiriaki Ioannidou, a current CHS fellow and a classical philologist specializing in Greek new comedy, papyrology and theater studies with advanced degrees from Oxford, University College London and the Open University of Cyprus. Um, since 2017, she's been working as a cultural officer at the Department of Cultural Services of the Deputy Minister of Culture of Cyprus, and since 2020 has been the president of the National Committee of Monuments of the Republic of Cyprus. Her research interests also include production and performance of new comedy, Greek and Roman drama more broadly, and material evidence related thereto, and perception of Greek drama. She has published a number of articles in these areas, and during her CHS fellowship, um, this spring, she's been working on her first monograph entitled Menander, Akayoi, uh, Theo for um, text translation and commentary, which will appear in the Fragmenta Comica series. So, uh, Kiriakim, I'm about ready to turn things over to you uh, for our conversation today titled Fragments of Menander in the Modern Stage. But <clears throat> as I tell you know, I'd like to ask you to begin by sharing with us how it was that you first came to your interest in Menander specifically. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, uh, for having me. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so Menander was very simple for me because when I studied classics, my BA in classics at the University of Athens, we had this amazing professor. It was uh, Professor Yanis Kostandakos, who's an inspiring teacher and amazing scholar, who taught us actually Menander, middle comedy and new comedy, but also Menander's discolos. And the way he taught Menander, like uh, in a performative way, uh, made Menander uh, sound so funny that um, I fell in love with uh, Menander like immediately. And I wanted to, I, I knew that I wanted to study Menander in depth and see um, what happens after Aristophanes. Because when I was a child, I I went to all these festivals of ancient Greek theater, watching um, per, uh, productions of uh, the Greek tra tragedians or Aristophanes, but nothing on Menander. And also Professor Costandagos encouraged me to pursue a master in uh, papyrology and ancient comedy, like middle and uh, new comedy. So that's why I went to Oxford to do uh, a master's on um, Aristophanes and Menander. And then my PhD was in, uh, in Menander as comedies. So it, this, the answer is very simple. Oh. I had a, an inspiring teacher who taught me Menander. Mm. Right. Uh, oh, I would make such a difference. I know. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. So today, I will talk about my ongoing work on two commentaries on Menandrian fragmentary plays and how this strictly philological work compelled me to envision a great opportunity to put fragmentary comedy on the modern stage. I will start with a few works on Menander and the state of his comedies, and then carry on with a brief discussion of my current research undertaken at the Center for Hellenic Studies. The second part of the talk will focus on a project I hope to undertake in the future that aims to examine the techniques and methods that can be utilized by contemporary directors to present fragments from ancient Greek comedy on the theater stage today. Menander is the best known representative of Athenian new comedy, renowned for his realistic portrayal of life and skillful character portraits. He said to have written uh, around 105 or 108 comedies, but must not have been among the most popular playwrights during his lifetime, winning only eight recorded victories. Menander, however, became very popular with later generations, and the scholar Aristophanes of Byzantium placed him second only to Homer among all the poets of Greece. Despite that, for a long period of time, only a small number of his plays were available, and in the dark ages of the 8th and 9th centuries, even these were lost, possibly because of their subject matter, because his plays deal with love and rape. 
Up until the end of the 19th century, Menander was preserved only through certain short extracts in anthologies, citations in grammarians and lexica, quotations by surviving authors like Athenaeus, Dibnosophistae, Stobaios, or Suda. The adaptations of through the adaptations of Menandrian plays by Terence and Plodus, uh, through a collection of famous quotations said to have been written by Menander, the so-called Menandris and Dentier, but of course we have many issues of authority and authenticity. Pluder's comparison between Aristophanes and Menander, and Pluder prefers Menander's polished comedies of character to the boisterous wit and humor of Aristophanes. An anonymous comparison between Menander and Philistion, who was an author of mimes, and of course a series of Greek and Latin testimonies. Towards the end of the 19th century, the story changes as the rediscovery of Menander begins with a few findings and advances rapidly in the 20th century. Arnott called it the century of Menander due to the spectacular papyrological discoveries of Menander plays, as you can see uh, on the slide. The rediscovery of Menander, which continues in the 21st century, stimulated the interest of scholars and has led to rapidly increasing number of publications on Menander's plays and their rich iconographic tradition. Now, scholars have the opportunity to interpret Menander on the basis of his own text, rather than interpreting him on the basis of secondary tradition or via the Latin adaptations of Plotus and Terence. The number of excellent commentaries on the best preserved Menander comedies is constantly increasing, with much good work also being done on fragmentary plays like Misumenos, we have Furley's uh, commentary in 2021, and Collax, without, however, any recent full treatment of the smaller fragmentary plays of Menander, such as the comedies included in the commentaries I'm working on. So these commentaries deal with the textual, linguistic, and pictorial evidence of 84 fragments, re-examining the papyri for new readings while incorporating the rich body of recent scholarship on new comedy. So the first um, uh, commentary is the Menandes Archaeo Theophorumene, which will be part of the Fragmenta Comica project, a project that is undertaken by the University of Freiburg in Germany with the aim to publish in almost like 80 volumes the fragments of all the ancient Greek comedians, um, all old, middle and new comedy. And the second volume is the Menandes Heros and Theophorumene, uh, with which I will start my um, discussion. So I'll talk briefly about these commentaries just to give you an idea about the material I'm working on. And we can discuss these comedies if you want later in our Q&A session. So the commentary on the Harrison Theft Rumini of Menander provide a, a full commentary and a full reconstruction, um, as full as possible, of course, of the hero and the god possessed girl, two lost comedies of Menander for, for which considerable papyrus evidence emerged in the course of the 20th century. In Heros, I was fascinated by Menander's amusing creation, unique in extant ancient comedy, of a slave character with features of a typical new comedy young man in love, who is miserable and melancholic. So we see here in the text that uh, Heros, uh, sorry, Daos, is uh, described by another slave as a tragic heroine. So why smug your scalp so much? Why stand and tear your hair out? Why whimper? Because he's in love. And then Dao says, Pebontha ten psuken, like my soul is suffering. Things that uh, a young man in love will, will say in, in Menander. Other important themes include the legal background of the twins, Plangon and Gorgias, who at the start of the play seem to exist in limbo between free citizen status and slavery. So Menander in this respect is a valuable source for legal historians. So if you see, for example, the word pediskin that he uses on the first line of the second text, um, this word can be used for both free and slave girls. So Menandria prefers to use this word um, rather than therapina, for example, which is used only for uh, slave girls, because he wants to emphasize the uncertain status of this girl. So that's why when in Geta's question, is she a slave? Dao's answers, yes, nearly, in a way. 
So the play has been uh, extensively discussed by legal historians, as I told you, especially in connection with the existence or not of a debt bondage practice in late fourth century Athens. So the verb hypotitheme that you can see in the third line of the uh, hypothesis. So we have a hypothesis for Heros. This is very good for the reconstruction of the plot. Um, this verb is used in both the active and middle voices and is used of debt bondage of the person or any other property in classical uh, text. Um, so the foster father says here, uh, pawn them for a loan. So are the twins slaves? Are they enslaved because of their father's death? What happens with the Solon's uh, law? Um, so as well, the plot is also interesting and innovative with a double rape and recognition pattern, which occurs only here in Exxon Menander. So we have, of course, uh, other comedies with a rape and recognition um, motifs, but here we have a double. So we have the mother uh, who was raped, and then we have the, the daughter. And the two rapes occurred at different times in the past, but their consequences are realized simultaneously to produce a very complex double intrigue. And in the end, it says the old man found and recognized his own, um, and the violator gladly took the girl. So in Theophorumini now, I was interested in the play's remarkably strong icono iconographic tradition and in the presence in the play of a music scene with singing, one of the very few in Menander, which is possibly a hymn to the goddess Sibylle. Iconography plays an important role in the tradition of Menander, providing valuable information on the comedy's popularity and afterlife, and useful elements for reconstruction of the place in places where the textual fragments are, are insufficient. So regarding Theophorumene, which has the richest iconographic tradition among Menander's extant plays, we have mosaics, frescoes, wall paintings, and terracottas dating from the 4th century BC when the play was first produced until the 3rd, 4th century AD, proving the great popularity of the play. All the monuments portray the music scene of the play with four or sometimes five figures dancing and playing the aulos, the cymbals, and the tympanon, the traditional instruments of the goddess Sibylle, as you can see here on this slide, where we see the uh, mosaic from the Mytilene um, house of Menander. Here, the Dioscuridis mosaic uh, found in the Villa of Cicero in Pompeii, dated in the late second, uh, third century BC. You can see that they have many things in similar, in similar. We also have an inscribed mosaic found uh, in Phidias' house at Schisamos uh, in Crete, late second or early third century AD, with the title Theophorumene. And of course, the, the, the Daphne mosaic of the third century AD, which was discovered in 2007 during an excavation in Antioch. Again, we have the title Theophorumini and figures playing uh, some instruments. Several other monuments may be related to the mosaics that represent the music scene of the play. I won't represent everything here, but I'm just showing you a copy of a wall painting from Stabia of the first century BC, uh, which is identical to the Dioscuridis mosaic that we just uh, saw. The identification of this uh, song dance scene with the Ferumini is assured both by titles on the mosaics, as we have seen, but also by the fact that some of the figures identified by name inscriptions fit names preserved on the papyrus PSI 1280. So if you see like the first yellow line on the papyrus, it says Lucias. And this name is uh, the name of the first figure on the mosaic. So it gives us like um, strong evidence to attribute this papyrus to Theophorumene. And of course, later we have the name Clanias, which is of the third figure, and Theophorate, like she is God-possessed. Also, the music scene on this material seems to be preserved on Papyrus PSI 1480, where a character sings a hymn to the goddess Sibylle. And we have uh, someone singing a hymn, we have the tumbanon, we have um, 
the Corribandes, who are the followers of Sibili. Moving now to the Fragmenta Comica volume of Menander, where the longest fragment we possess contains six verses, the methodology and focus of research changed dramatically. There are no more discussion on plot lines, like do we have dead bondage, we're not, is she a slave, is she not, or we don't have like a problem of positioning the fragments in the plot, like we have in Heros with the smaller fragments, we don't know exactly if they are in the third act or the fourth act, we don't have a problem with names or characters. Now one needs to put the fragments into their context to gain an understanding of why it was cited in that lexicon, to um, work on the content of each fragment, which are uh, mostly maxims and proverbs, and the very details of the words used by Menander, like their position in the sentence, why are they at the beginning or the end, their connection to other words to emphasize maybe something, or the syntactical phenomena. The plant for Winter Comica volume deals with fragments 89 to 169 of Castle and Austin of Menander. Um, and of course, the book will follow the same structure as the other uh, volumes of this uh, project series, with the introduction to the play and an emphasis on the citation context and on the state of the preserved uh, text. And of course, uh, a very detailed commentary on, um, the, on the fragments. The fragments, these fragments are preserved through the direct tradition. We have some papyri, but like only a couple of them. Indirect tradition, mostly, codations and testimonies, and iconographic tradition with um, some mosaics and label tags. As you will see, Menander was frequently quoted by grammarians and lexicographers, not only to due to his philosophical appeal, but also because he was perceived to be a useful linguistic source. For example, uh, we're going to look at instances that represent Menander as a philosopher and as a source of Hellenistic poetry. So the first example, we have a fragment from Akaioi Peloponnese, where Menander provides a glimpse on how Tuki was perceived during the Hellenistic age, when she was worshipped ex extensively as she was believed to control human lives. So Menander says that, but Tuki fortune trained him in poverty and humbleness through his sufferings in order to gain back his glorious path and have his fortune changed. So uh, the important element uh, distinguishing this representation of Tuki from other representations in Menander is that Tuki is portrayed not only as a goddess who rewards the person who shows good behavior or forgives other characters, but as a goddess who will train this person, a gumnase, in order to help them regain their good fortune. The second example from Didymai, the twin sisters, uh, is about manumitive slaves. So ancient historians base several discussions on ancient Athenian law on Menandrian fragments, as we have seen before in Heros. So in Harpocratia, we see that uh, they cite a fragment in the Lima on Metoikion, which according to Hyperides was a tax that the Metoikoi, the resident aliens, had to pay to avoid being sent away. So Menander refers to this Metokion informing us that on top of um, the 12 drachmas that had to be paid to the city, the manumitted slaves, the freed slaves, had to also pay three obols to the tax collector. And this fact is found only in this Menandrian text, something that makes this fragment valuable to ancient historians. Very interesting are also the testimonies and pictorial evidence of Menandrian fragments, which play a great role in the discussion of fragmentary plays, especially when they provide information about, not only about the content of the play, but especially about the existence of a play. So for example, this Akaioi uh, mosaic was found in 1954 in Bulgaria. And before the finding of this mosaic, this comedy was unknown. We didn't know that Menander wrote a comedy entitled Akaioi. And we have this mosaic, so okay, we have a new play by Menander. And then we, we find the papyrus P. Oxy 2462, which contains a list of titles from Menandrian plays 
and it includes Menander's Akaioi Peloponnesioi. Uh, another very interesting, uh, exciting thing I found is that uh, there is a small a scrap of papyrus found at Oxyrhynchus that preserves the title of a Menandrian play. So we know now that Menander uh, wrote an Embibramene, uh, The Girl Set on Fire. And this fragment is a very, very small uh, fragment with a rectangular shape, like a long strip in the form of a book label. So such little tags uh, were called a syllaboy and they represent, they were made of papyrus or parchment, which were glued or tied to the outside of the roll with the title hanging down and facing outwards. So they included information about the content of the roll, like the author's name and the title of the work in order to help with the identification and retrieval of the roll when it was stood either on a shelf or stored in a cylindrical container for a papyrus book rolls. And you can see how the tags uh, were placed in this drawing you have there. So while working on these fragments and focusing especially on Menandria Maxim's own life, marriage, death, and love, I felt that the wealth of philosophical quests and great universal messages deserve to be presented and made available to the wider theater audience. Not only my two commentaries on Menander, but also the volumes of the Fragmenta Comica project could be used to this end. Each volume includes the ancient text accompanied by translation into English, German, or Italian and extensive commentaries. Therefore, theater professionals who wish to delve into the fragmentary text of ancient comedy will have the opportunity to do so, as the published and forthcoming volumes will render the wealth of ancient comic fragments easier to access and study. Having all this in mind, I started to think about a parallel project which introduces a new approach to Menandrian fragments, examining them both from the philological and theatrical perspectives with the goal of investigating the possibilities of staging fragmentary texts. Study has been carried out on basic principles of cognitive science and neuroscience, which govern the way in which the human brain receives and interprets information fragments. The fact, the fact is that each piece of information received by the human brain from its environment is only a part of the specific information and not its complete picture. Therefore, whatever sound and words we present to the audience, even if some words don't make sense, like um, a fragmentary text, they will try to isolate and decode them to give them meaning based on their own knowledge and previous experiences. Therefore, and given that context is absent from fragmentary theatrical texts, both creative actors and the audience are given the opportunity to spontaneously and freely assign their own meanings to the text in their attempt to fill in the missing gaps of the puzzle unfolding in front of them. The motif for dealing with the cognitive science and neuroscience was the workshop I attended at King's College London in August 2017, where Laura Swift, now at Oxford University, presented the, re the research she had begun to carry out in collaboration with theatre professionals and the Potential Difference Theatre Company, which deals with the use of tragic fragments in the modern uh, theatre stage. The result of this project is the play Fragments, written by Laura Swift and Russell Bander, Bender, which was put on a few weeks ago in London and will be presented in Oxford uh, next week. The series of workshops and discussion panels that the Fragments team organized aim to explore how fragments of ancient um, Greek lost plays might be turned into art. They have been uh, working closely with a neuroscientist on how ideas of fragmentation relate to research on the fragmented nature of our human perception. During the workshop in London, they presented their experimentation with various techniques that could work when dealing with fragments on stage. For example, uh, they used optical and audio illusions, and you can find these examples uh, on their website that I have in your handout. So they work with, for example, phonemic restoration effects, which is uh, uh, the way that speech is distorted or interrupted with white noise uh, gradually introduced into the gaps. 
or seen a wave speech like a distortion technique where recorded speech is, is turned into something that resembles a science fiction sound effect. Uh, they were also interested in looking into change blindness and in attention blindness, how our desire to create a continuous narrative out of the fragments of information we receive leads us to overlook important aspects of our environment or changes that happen when we're not looking. And the most uh, famous example of inattention blindness is the Harvard basketball player experiment that you might know. So um, let's have a look at it to see what uh, I mean. This is a, the basketball. So you try to count how many times they pass the ball, people with white shirts. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> so as you can see, because we were focused to um, see how many passes they were made we didn't see some of us didn't see the gorilla so these methods and techniques proved to be extremely useful when presenting the fragmentary text to the theater audience making the text more accessible and interesting to the audience simultaneously stimulating their interest and inviting them subconsciously to give meaning to the gaps found in the papyri, as well as to the verbal and auditory stimuli that were presented before them. Therefore, some of the uh, aforementioned methods and techniques were examined during the compilation of the fragmentary text of the short experimental performance I created to explore the possibility of staging Menandrian fragments. Besides the fragments uh, project, of course, in the recent years, there has been a growing interest in dealing with fragmentary texts of ancient tragedy. As early as 1995, Timothy Woodridge, professor in the USA, drew the attention of philologists and theater professionals to the need to create performances based on fragmentary texts of ancient Greek and Latin theater. So he envisions two major and two minor ways in which the fragments might be staged. So the first one is like a workshop production um, taking place probably at conferences as, or, or in the classroom as stage readings. And then we have formal productions with the full budget and using all the resources of the theater, like stage and scenery and lights. Uh, of course, you can, in, in these formal productions, you can also work on fragments by giving author, like as virtuoso pieces. So you get some pieces, um, let's say, of Philoctetes, and then uh, one actor uh, reads that performs them to show like his uh, story of Philoctetes and his pain. Or you can recast a completely new play around the fragments, either through incorporating the fragments in it or take the theme and idea and develop a, a new full length play. These methods ha have been in used in recent years by directors, especially in Cyprus and Greece, who receive a fragmentary text of an ancient Greek drama and with the appropriate dramaturgical and directorial interventions presented on stage as a complete performance. Typical examples uh, are the following. So um, the first thing that a director could do is to choose a fragmentary play, most of which is preserved, and choose to fill in the gaps with new text, presenting the audience with a complete play. So a typical example is Menander's Samia, directed by Evie Gavrilidis and translated by uh, Yanis Varveris for the Theatrical Organization of Cyprus. The show drew on comedy of manners and romantic comedy and French vaudeville, while catchy choral songs were added, which were absent from new comedy, of course, and a prologue was also added. 
which brought liveliness and a lot of laughter to the performance, rendering the Menandes comedy more accessible to the public. The second example is when a director chooses to use text from the work of a specific author, whether these texts come from fragmentary or complete works, and present them to the audience as an autonomous text with or without a coherence between the various fragments, but as a complete play. So a typical example is the Piconoi directed by Theodoros Terzopoulos, who used text from fragmentary tragedies by Ischylus to touch upon the absurdity of war. The characters of the play come from heroic mythology. So we have like Hercules and Prometheus and Achilles and Philoctetes. And Terzopoulos says that what I did in Epikonoi had the structure of an ancient tragedy. Yet I wasn't really interested in creating a proper play. And I worked based on improvisations of the actors with the fragments of the ancient text. And he carries on, and this is very important for me, that it is my opinion that you don't have to complete a fragment. You don't have to restore its wholeness. You don't have to rewrite it. You must leave it exactly as it is, because a fragment is also a trauma, just like the columns in the archaeological sites, which have fallen on the ground and they bleed, they are injured. A third example is when a director selects fragments of text from different playwrights, which he connects under a common theme, a common subject, and presents them as a single work. So a typical example is Apollonia by Warlikowski, which deals with self-sacrifice using fragments from the ancient tragedians as well as from modern authors. Varlikovsky cuts these texts up, reinforces them with other stories, comments and challenges the meanings, and poses dilemmas to his audience. What will they do in the place of Iphigenia, Alkistis, or Apollonia? In the stage presentation of the play, Warlikovsky used several techniques on, of contemporary performance that further highlighted the techniques of compiling fragments from different theatrical and literary works. So, for example, he used live music from a rock band, puppet theater with life-size puppets, handheld camera with live projection of black and white images. As shown from the above examples, the majority of theater artists who decide to deal with fragmentary texts tend to fill in the gaps of the text to present a complete performance or combine the fragments with other texts, dramatic or otherwise, under a common theme or a common component to create a complete play. The majority of directors who decide to stage a fragmentary text also uh, turn to the tragic fragments as their subjects are more familiar because they deal with heroes of, of mythology, well-known stories of royal families, and find an easier response among the audience. The research, the research I hope to undertake in the future will focus on the use of fragments of ancient Greek comedy without any attempt to reconstruct them or create a complete theatrical work. This decision comes as a consequence of the principles of cognitive science and neuroscience that we briefly mentioned above. After all, fragmentation is an important part of comic plays themselves, even those that survive in their entirety. Since at the core of these plays, there must be information fragmented and perplexed for the purpose of provoking comic misunderstandings. Indeed, the research, uh, the richness of the ancient Greek theater that is hidden in the thousands of, of fragments that are preserved through direct and indirect tradition can be brought again on stage, and the timing is particularly appropriate as the development of contemporary post-dramatic and post-modern forms of theater like performance or device theater, which are characterized by interactivity and experimentation, provide fertile ground for the creation of theatrical compositions out of fragmentary texts. In fact, I have already experimented by filming a short performance of compiled text, which are technically unrelated to each other, which created a collage of intertextual and demonstrative points of reference. So the theatrical media and techniques incorporated into the performance, such as video projection, stuff text, and other audiovisual material, aim to act as a link between the different fragments to strengthen the connection between um, 
the different uh, textual references and the various theatrical media and techniques without, however, reducing the sense and the concept of the fragmentary nature of the text. Through this um, performance, I suggest avoiding the traditional practice of reconstruction of the text, aiming to highlight the timeless philosophical messages contained in the fragmentary text of ancient comedy and celebrate the fragmentation of this text. For the creation of the performance, a number of fragments from Menander were used, uh, which deal with important and timeless issues of our daily life, as you can see on, um, on this slide. Fragments from uh, various Menander comedies, some intertextual references from the Menander Sendentie, as well as the poem Safo il Nefgada by the Cypriot poet Kyriakos Haralambidis, uh, were selected. Theatrical performance in a non-conventional theater space, it was a bookstore in a traditional house in the old city of Nicosia in Cyprus, surrounded by video projections and fragmentation in the voice and movements of the actors, was considered to be the more suitable technique for the interpretation of these fragments. So we're going to see like... um extracts from, from this performance. So here we have Aspis, it's about war, it's about how bad war is and that um, they kill people and how uh, bad consequences come that they were. So uh, you can ha you have the takes of uh, Menander's Aspis, we're gonna see like a few minutes of it so that you can see um, how uh, we use the text, the performance, and uh, the the projection behind the actor. Στη λικία υπάρχει ένας ποταμός που ονομάζεται Ξάνθος. Εκεί είχαμε λάβει μέρος σε αρκετές μάχες. Ευτυχώς, χωρίς να έχουμε μεγάλες απόλυτες. Νικήσαμε τους εκδρούς και τους ανακάσαμε σε άντακτο φυγή. Στη συνέχεια λαιλατήσαμε πολλά Καταστρέψαμε, Καταστρέψαμε τους αγρούς και πουλήσαμε όλα τα λάθη να πολέμει του λάβα. Επιστρέψαμε όλοι με πολλά λεφτά στο στρατηγείο μας. Αλλά βλέπεις όταν χάνεις σε συνεδρίκωση, ενώ όταν κερδίζεις η υπερβολική αισιοδοξία σου σε οδηγεί πολλές φορές σε ολέκτρια λάθη. Έτσι και εμείς, με τον αέρα και την υπεροψία του νικητή, πορευτήκαμε στην επόμενη μάχη με μεγάλη αντιχαρτία. Και σε κάποια ανήκοπη στιγμή πρέπει να ήταν γύρω στα μεσάνικο. Στεκόμουν στη Σκοπιά και φιλούσα τους στρατιώτες και τα λάθη να μας πρέπει ξαφνικά τους αγωνές, τους παρακτικές κραυγές, τους άντρες να τρέχουν, να τρυμούν και να φωνάζουν. Από αυτούς άκουσα τα τραγικά μαντάτα, ήταν το ευθυδιασμό που δεχτήκαμε και την άγρια σφαγή που ακολούθησε. Όλοι με κρυμαζεύτηκαν σε ένα μέρος. Τα ήταν ευθυναυτικά. So it's a very emotional thing about war and about tombs and um, dead soldiers that we find in Menander. So the next one is about, um, it's about Heros and the rape. Um, and this text is very, very uh, mutilated. Uh, so uh, we tried to show these by um, the broken lines. So you'll hear now in the, what's happening with the voice of the actor. Πόσο φρικτά είναι όλα όσα μου συνέβησαν, πόσο ανυπόφορη είναι αυτή η δυστυχία που κουβαλώ μέσα μου. Τόσα χρόνια, μόνη μου, σε ποιο να μιλήσω. Φρικτά, τόσο φρικτά, που δεν το φοράει ανθρώπινο νου. And the last one is about uh, in Sikioni, it's about, uh, let's say, human trafficking and people uh, sold like slaves uh, sold in the, the markets. And uh, uh, you will see at the end that it says that in Merandrian comedies, most of the times, uh, people find their biological parents, families, and they live happily ever after. But what happens really uh, in real life? So in this experimental uh, performance, 
Uh, fragmentary elements were used in the movement and voice of the actors, such as the interrupted voice using a special microphone, interrupted light, and the projection of fragmentary images on the screen in order to emphasize the fragmentary nature of the text. The sense of continuity in a performance with thematically unrelated text was attempted through the unified stage and the use of the same stage objects in different scenes, like same props. The sets, costumes, and props were thought to be minimal as the purpose of the performance is to highlight the content of the text and its fragmentation. The conclusion of the short performance and its overall aim is to highlight the importance of fragmentary texts as autonomous theatrical pieces, which do not need to be reconstructed to be presented in a performance or a stage reading. There is a wealth of fragments from a single word to whole scenes, which hide great proverbs and messages for all aspects of our life and can be projected to the audience as philosophical essences. This will help them in their philosophical quest and to get to know better the world world of Greek comedians, and especially Menander, who behind the veil of comedy, which in the minds of most uh, translates as light work, hides great truths about life. In, in his fragments, as evident from the short performance, we find proverbs about luck and its volatility, anti-war messages, opinions against human trafficking, but also lighter messages about marriage and women. This research could be further developed by systematizing the academic and practical application of the use of fragmentary text in contemporary theater. The beginning can be done with the creation of a database, which will host all the texts of the ancient comedians, categorized by subjects and by work, translated into English and annotated, with the aim of making these texts accessible to theater professionals. So theater professionals will have the opportunity not only to use this text in performance, performances of fragmentary text in the form of stage readings uh, or performances, but also to integrate them into production of, of complete works as an introduction to one of the topics covered by the performance or as an intertextual reference. The database can be the platform through which links of cooperation will be created between theater artists and experts from the fields of classical philology, theater studies, literature, directing, and neuroscience. To sum up and taking into consideration the conclusions drawn from both the theoretical investigation and the practical engagement with Menander's fragmentary texts, I suggest that theater professionals distance, them, distance themselves from the traditional uh, effort to reconstruct a fragmentary text and turn towards exploiting the fragmentation of this text through contemporary stage pro staging practices, emphasizing on actor kinesiology, technology, sound, and lighting. The fragmentation that governs people's daily lives and this segmented way of living provides the most suitable background for dealing with fragmentary texts in the form of snapshots thematically being unrelated to each other. The research fills a significant gap in the literature and the practical involvement, involvement with ancient Greek comedy on the modern stage, as the interest in ancient Greek fragments is mostly limited to ancient tragedy. We trust that this, the proposed research and the creation of a database shall trigger for further research in this subject field through the conjunction of theoretical investigation and practical application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiyaki, for sharing your exciting research, and not just research, but practice, as you showed us some of these uh, stagings. Mm -hmm. and switch the view here to to show us all for our, our conversational part of the mm -hmm. part of the show here um, <laughs> okay it's time for any questions or comments um, from those of us assembled um, yeah georgia go ahead um thank you very much for the inspiration the work and um, the input and the presentation, of course. Um, I would like to ask the following. Um, how much is the, the nature of the new comedy and what Menanda represents, um, let's say, the background and the, um, obviously the foundation, the, the 
uh, requirement for such an adaptation, for such a uh, take uh, on modern stage, um, because um, I can't imagine that such thing could happen with Aristophanes for obvious reasons. Um, yes, and actually I, I have in mind then, uh, actually for me only new comedy is working in this, in this respect. Um, yeah. The, um, I think there is a 95 production of Sean, where he used three um, uh, or four, no, he used four uh, Romans and Menander to present uh, the, the mice of the cook, the tart and his mother, which is, I think, says it all about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, so, so um, what was the question about if Aristophanes is going to work or what's... Actually, how do you assess? It's a thing. It's a, I think Menander, because you uh, you talk so highly of Menander, and obviously there is this. Uh, yeah, I can tell this passion about him, but obviously there is he. Uh, he presents a different era, and uh, there are such novelties. And I would, yeah, mm. I would like to ask yes, you. Okay, to so bridge, perhaps we do have a lot of fragments by Aristophanes as well, uh, but because they are so different um uh, from Menander we we can also put on a, a production with Aristophanic fragments but I think that the audience will um um expect to see like this you know um great uh, productions of uh, the boisterous uh, wit and laugh of Aristophanes so I don't know if it's gonna work in in, in these terms but uh Menander uh, okay, he comes like in a later era, of course, uh, the um, end of the fourth century. We have new comedy. We don't have like a, it's not, uh, we don't have um, uh, attacks to politicians. We don't have like the chorus, you know, um, which it was very important as um, part of Aristophanic comedy. We have all these um uh, how can I say, like, uh, new uh, the, the young man who falls in love with the young woman and they try to get married and, uh, you know, with it, they have all these obstacles. And um, Menander talks a lot about um, fortune and love and death. And uh, uh, we, we do have many fragments from other uh, poets of, of new comedy and middle comedy, of course, that they could uh, be used. Um but I think that uh, because we have also better preserved um, comedies of Menander, that's why we can we can work on his fragments like in a better way, because we we know a little bit more about his plots and about his characters. That's why we can work on his fragments. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, we can also uh, work on other new comic comic uh, fragments uh, or middle comedy like uh, Alexis and Antiphanes and uh, they have actually uh, written comedies with the same titles with Aristophanes and we have find some similarities in their um, in the content of their fragments so yes I don't know if I if I answer your question but how I, I... Know, so I was heading to the same yeah that mm. was uh, verification. I was heading to the same idea, and uh, he's legendary for his uh, essential in the sense that he has this gnomai, this golden. Oh yes, uh, of course, the so he's, he's very. Everybody just in a way has it's it rings a bell when you hear Menanda that you can in a way collect uh, patchwork and present it. Yes, and, and we still like in Greek we still use many of these proverbs and many of his sententiae in our daily life, and, and most people don't know, don't even know that they come from Menander. But of course, there is this problem with authenticity. We don't know if it's actually Menander. It might be Euripides. It might be like from other authors because we find the exact same um, uh, gnome in other um, or comic poets as well. And also, if you have like um, a fragment coming down from uh, lexicographers or grammarians, sometimes you're not sure about the exact words of the fragment or if someone mixed it up. <laughs> And yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, George, I see. The George has a question, then Anne, and then Jack. Yeah. George, you might still be muted. We can't. We can't yes, hear you. Yes, we can't hear you. Yes.
So maybe let's go to Anne while uh, George, you can work on your audio. Can't, can't okay. Sorry. Thank you for that. I, I found that fascinating. Um, what I was wondering though was whether you experience any tension uh, between the the creation of modern theatre and the development of the understanding of the primary source. And if those two things are intention, how do you resolve it? Because it seems to me theatre has to have a market um, and it, it, it has an audience. So you have to mm. please other people. Um, and, and yet there are other values that come into play when you try to assess, you know, what's going on in a primary source. Exactly. This is the, the, the problem. And this is why people uh, are afraid of fragments and especially mm. comic fragments, because when you have tragic fragments, it's so easier because people know these uh, these uh, heroes, people know the stories of the real families, and uh, they like to hear about uh, all these tragic uh, stories. But when it comes uh, to comedy, uh, they don't know much about comedy after Aristophanes or other than Aristophanes and um th there will it will be a problem in in um, in this manner um as you say but uh the thing is we have to try to uh, <laughs> to um let people know that you know there's also this kind of comedy and there are also these uh, these amazing uh, comic playwrights that they didn't survive and we have these fragments and we want you to know about them and to uh, study these uh, proverbs and all these maxims. Uh, of course, at the beginning, it will be like a smaller audience, uh, but that's why you're going to work with um, uh, post-modern like types of theater and, and post-dramatic like performance and, and device theater because these types of theater, they work on a fragments anyway. Um, so why not to use fragments from ancient Greek comic, uh, comic playwrights? See, and uh, see how this works with it. Um, and sometimes maybe the audience won't be able to tell if uh, in a performance of device theater or improvisation, national theater, uh, they won't be able to tell if you don't tell them that, you know, this is from an under. They might think that it's a new like production, um, written by a modern author about life or about death or about love. So I, I of course, there are, there are gonna be difficulties, um, but it's worth trying. Oh, I entirely yeah. agree, yes. Okay, thank you right. very much. Thank you. George, do you have your audio back? Let me give it another try. Oh, I'm not sure yet. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep, we can hear you. What a fantastic, wonderful lecture and idea and presentation. Beautifully done. Uh, very exciting morning. Um, I think of the uh, similar effects of muse museum studies. Mm -hmm. we, we get all kinds of little chips and stuff. And uh, scholars sit and piece them together and give them the context. Give them, but the objective, it has always been. Mm. to recreate what it was and put it in its original context. Exactly. But with the whole evolution of the postmodern uh, existence, you know, uh, th there is no line between then and now. We're all part of the same continuum. Mm -hmm. And so to do what you, you've been doing there is absolutely great. And I could see that with, you know, going through uh, the uh, Epicor, uh, the comic fragments of, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but the big collection with uh, Aristophanes. Mm -hmm. And then there's also uh, Aeschylus, Euripides, and all the, the broken pieces, which, yes, you could take them and try and reconstruct what they were really like. But if you can't, they can be put to good use anyway and make whole new art. It's just fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your kind words. And we also have like documentary theater when people use like newspapers and stories and we could use like fragments um, talking about um, ancient Athenian law, for example. So I think that theater professionals need to uh, know that they have access to these fragments 
which is very difficult right now, but with all these new commentaries and, and translations, I think they will be able to understand the fragments better and um, maybe use them in their uh, productions, performances, or stage readings. You also made a good point about how the a lot of the fragments were preserved by grammarians to focus a particular to extract just a particular idea from the whole picture. And so that idea becomes a seed for the new idea that can be done with it. It's really great. Thank you so much. I'll be Thank quiet. Uh, Jack. Yes. Oh, I, I, I agree with George uh, just about all of that. And, you know, it's, it's, this is something that we could have a, a whole weekend workshop on, I think. I know. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. Um, you know, one, one of the uh, um, major things that, that uh, hit me uh, rereading Menander is, 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 uh, is how much Aristotle, Aristotle's ethics, uh, and, uh, and also uh, Theophrastus's characters, you know, comes you know, Theophrastus is re reportedly a, a teacher of yes. Menander. When, yes, exactly. And Aristotle was, of course, um, Theophrastus's teacher. So mm -hmm. these texts would be very familiar to to Aristotle, for, uh, to Menander. For example, you know, uh, one of the themes of the ethics is, is uh, the contrast between Techne and Touche. And you see that, you know, just subtly coming coming through in in the different text passages, um, uh, including uh, the one that, that you uh, started out with. From Achaia, the Achaeans, yes. Yes, and we see that uh, there are some of the process characters. We find them as um, characters in Menander's um, uh, plays or even as titles. So we have Desidemo, the superstitious man. It's a character in Theophrastus characters and also a comedy by Menander, which is fragmented, of course. But yes, you can see like the connection there and um, how much of philosophy Menander has in his um, in his uh, comedies. And there are like uh, many articles about this uh, particular philosophical essence in Menander's plays. And I think it's, it's fantastic. Right. And, and you know, I think about the issue of, of uh, popularity. Mm. I don't think Samuel Beckett, you know, <laughs> worried too much about that when he wrote Crap's Last Tape, you know. Mm. He had a message. And, had a message, yes. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, people put it together. I mean, uh, and, it, you know, it's still a classic. Of course, and because we we see some we see a fragment, we have this urge to fill in the gaps. Uh, we really want to fill in the gaps, and uh, then when you you're not giving given a meaning, and then you give your own meaning uh, based on your own knowledge or experiences, and maybe these will make the the play um, more important for you. I mean, right. in a sense, and and it's just a tremendous. Uh, it's a tremendous repertoire mm. that's there, somewhat veiled, you know, through mm. the through the abs through the chant. Touche has taken yeah. away so much of <laughs> the corpus, but but you know we read the the fragments and you know knowing other things, you know, the more you study Greek tragedy uh, and Greek comedy, the the the, the complete plays. Then you go to the fragments, you get so much more out of the fragments yes. and, you know, your, you know, your, your real life experience and your, your literary experience come met, merge, you know, like when you see um, the expression, uh, Thalassan uh, Echeron, uh, yes. you know, uh, or Echeron, uh, you know, like I, I poured out the sea. You know, you can, you can, you might think of, uh, you know, an old Norse uh, legend, you know, where, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, 
Sarah can probably fill this in a little better than I. But anyway, there's there just there's so much ambiguity in mm. the in the fragments that doesn't get resolved unless the reader creates that. Exactly. We have more questions rather than the answers, especially. And if you see these commentaries, like the discussion of the problems of the text or of the meaning are like bigger than the discussion on the actual text. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I really, you know, I, like George said it all really, you know, in, in Nutsi, uh, you know, that uh, this is just great. And it's a it's a wonderful new direction, you know. Uh, and we we should have fun with the texts and not just labor all over them, you know, reconstructing. Is this an alpha or is this a delta? <laughs> of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kiraki. Should thank our guest. And I, I thank you all for joining us here in this conversation. And thanks to those of you out there watching. So thank you very much. See you thanks again everyone. next time. All of you. Okay, we're off the air. Thanks again.